Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. It's episode six, and this time we're stepping away from books and wandering into the wild world of journalism and newspapers. Now, if you've dared to look at any social media over the past few years, you'll have seen a certain person shouting about fake news. Whether or not you want to believe those tirades, fake news is real. Or at least it was back in August 1835, when the country and even parts of Europe were swept up in some truly out-of-this-world fake news. Hold on to your spaceships, because as I promised last time, this is going to be a fun episode. But first, yeah, it's sponsorship time. I just want to say that if you're enjoying this podcast, you can show your support by doing nothing other than the shopping you normally do. See, the folks over at Amazon have said to the book owl, if you send customers our way, we'll give you a tiny commission. And the book owl said, hootylicious. How this works is that for any item you buy on Amazon, I'll get a tiny percentage to help with the cost of keeping this show running. It costs you nothing extra, and it's super simple. All you have to do is the next time you think you need something, anything from Amazon, rather than going directly to Amazon's website, go instead to the bookoutpodcast.com slash support and just scroll down a tiny bit and head to Amazon using the link on that page. Then when you do your shopping, I get my commission. Unfortunately, this only really works for my U.S. listeners, but that page also has some other super affordable ways to help keep the show running. Okay, are you ready for some fake news? Well, then let's get in the Wayback Machine and head to New York, 1835. It's the 25th of August, and as people open up their copies of the New York Sun, they're greeted with the first of six articles about a major scientific discovery. It would revolutionize their understanding of the world, and it could mean we're not alone in the universe. Or it could just mean people are really, really gullible. So these articles collectively became known as the Great Moon Hoax. And they were supposed to have been written by Dr. Andrew Grant to report on a study published in the Edinburgh Journal of Science. And because lay people obviously couldn't possibly understand the complexities of scientific jargon, Grant decided to write a series of articles explaining in easy-to-read language an amazing discovery. So Grant, I'll just tell you right now, he was nothing but a complete fabrication. But supposedly, he was a colleague of Sir John Herschel, and these articles reported on Herschel's recent work. Now, John Herschel was a real person, and he really was an astronomer, among many other things, including a mathematician, an engineer, and he was just really an all-around brainy type of guy. According to Grant's story, Herschel had gone to South Africa in 1834 to set up a huge telescope at a new observatory. The first article was primarily about the telescope and how it was set up. But the next few articles were all about what Herschel observed using this telescope. And what did Herschel observe? Wonders upon wonders! I mean, the discoveries reported were so astounding, the very fact that Herschel didn't have a heart attack from just the pure excitement of it all should have been a clue that maybe this wasn't real. The moon, according to the sun which, wait, that sounds really weird. The moon, according to the sun's articles, was amazing. The landscape alone was a wonder to behold. This wasn't just a white pockmarked surface that everybody assumed it was. It had, well, of course it had craters, but it also had amethyst crystal outcroppings, gorgeous flowing rivers, lush tropical vegetation, and, yes, beaches. What? Beaches? Tell me more! Sorry, newsreader, but you're going to have to buy the next paper to learn those landscapes were nothing compared to Herschel's other findings. And people really did 
keep buying. Basically, the New York Sun was running the clickbait scam of the day. The paper's sales prior to these articles had been slumping, but people became eager to learn more about this unprecedented discovery. And sales, as each day went on, dare I say it? Okay, I will. Sales skyrocketed. But that's not to say, unlike the clickbait scams right now, it's not to say people didn't get their money's worth when they were buying these papers, because the next article revealed, are you ready for this? There was life on the moon. And if you thought beaches were good, well, wait till you get a load of the creatures you're going to encounter when you go visit those beaches. So we start off with some tame bison. Then we move up to unicorns, because why not? There were also these two-legged, tailless beaver things, which, if it doesn't have a tail and it's walking on two legs, I don't even know how that's a beaver, but possibly the most astounding creature that Herschel discovered were these human-like beings that had bat wings. Yes, listeners, that's right. The moon, not Gotham City, was the original home of Batman. Unfortunately, the moon missed out on a huge franchise opportunity by naming them Man Bats. Grant even reported that Herschel had, and I quote, scientifically denominated them as Vespertilo Homo, or Man Bat, and they are doubtless innocent and happy creatures. Okay, so remember I said that Grant was a pseudonym? It's believed that the actual author of the articles was a man who worked for the Sun named Richard Adams Locke. And he honestly didn't think people were gullible enough to believe this stuff. But as we know, people will believe what they want to believe. And you couldn't argue with the sales numbers. So Locke wisely kept mum about the hoax. So you might be thinking, okay, so it's in the New York Sun. This is probably just a, you know, local little joke phenomenon, whatever. But this story wasn't just being picked up in New York. It spread throughout the United States and across the pond to Italy, Germany, and the UK. Loads of people believe this. Even a big old smarty pants like Ralph Waldo Emerson was taken in. As were some scientists from Yale University who, as scientists are want to do, were eager to see the source material for Grant's articles. So these Yale guys traveled to New York to see firsthand the study from the Edinburgh Journal of Science. The trouble was, is that that scientific journal had ceased publication in 1833, two years before the Moon Hoax articles. But as I said, Locke and the Sun wanted to keep this whole thing under wraps to keep sales coming in. So what do they end up doing? They end up shuffling the Yaleys from the printing office back to another office and then back to the printing office telling them that the oh the source material is over here. No, it's over here. When in fact it never existed in the first place. The Yale guys, they ran out of time for their little excursion and they returned to Yale none the wiser. Eventually, however, people began to question the article's veracity. And this doubt, it did start actually with the very first article, um, that one where they were talking about Herschel's telescope setup. See, the telescope was supposed to be 24 feet in diameter and weighed seven tons, or which is about 6,700 kilograms. This massive thing, according to the article, had been transported from England to South Africa. And this was the early 1800s. They had enough trouble just transporting basic goods like food and clothing, let alone this giant, delicate piece of scientific equipment. So that raised a little, you know, speculation about what's going on here. The skeptics did finally get their way, and a month after the first article came out, The Sun revealed that the articles were indeed just a bit of satire. In fact, Locke, the guy who actually wrote the articles, he had a specific target in mind that he was poking fun at. See, astronomy was capturing people's imagination 
during this time. Maybe a bit too much imagination. In 1824, for example, a German professor of astronomy, a professor, mind you, published a paper with the lengthy title of Discovery of Many Distinct Traces of Lunar Inhabitants, Especially One of Their Colossal Buildings. In the paper, he reports seeing roads and cities on the moon. I I don't know, maybe the professor was dipping into the beer stein a few too many times during the day, but <laughs> there's no cities on the moon. But it was papers like these that had people convinced that life really did exist on the moon. And this led up to speculations and a full book published by Reverend Thomas Dick, who asserted without any room for doubt that the moon had 4.2 billion inhabitants. Now, keep in mind that at this time, Earth only had around 1 billion people living on it. Locke couldn't resist poking fun at such an idea, and poke he did with great success. So what was the end result when people found out that this was just a big old hoax? Did people cry foul at the sun? Did they demand the paper be shut down? Did they cancel their subscriptions? Nope. Most readers had a good laugh at themselves for being so easily pulled into this. And the sun's sales actually stayed pretty steady after that. And the hoax it, it wasn't just a one-and-done thing. Over the next few months, you could buy yourself moon hoax merchandise, including wallpaper and snuff boxes. From the time of the big reveal, a month after the articles came out, and throughout the rest of the 19th century, anything deceptive became known as moon hoaxy, which I think I'm going to start using that word from now on. But what about Herschel, you know, the astronomer guy? Was his career ruined by this? Did people claim he was less credible as a scientist? Nope again. In fact, at first, he was amused by the articles and kind of enjoyed the silliness of them. But as the years went on, he did start getting a little annoyed because people kept asking him, instead of asking him about his real work, kept asking him about the life he discovered on the moon. The only person at the time who seemed to have been really bothered by the hoax was Edgar Allan Poe. See, Locke had been his editor, and a few months prior to the hoax, Poe had written a short story about life on the moon. And this story had plenty of similarities to the great moon hoax articles. It was also a story that Locke had edited. The story had been published in another paper, but it, the popularity of it just never took off. I think Poe was mainly upset that Locke's version of the story got more attention than his own version of it. And as a little side note, a few years later, The Sun published another series of hoax articles written by Poe himself. Uh, th these were about a hot air balloon ride over the Atlantic. And this is what actually brought me to learn about the Great Moon hoax, was learning about this hot air balloon article. Unfortunately for Poe, these hot air balloon articles just didn't grab the world like the Great Moon hoax. So, you know, he loses out again. Poor guy. So that's all I've got for the Great Moon Hoax. Um, I really do think it is great, and all I can say is that the fake news of 1835 was way more entertaining than the supposed fake news of today. For those of you who get the Book Owl podcast newsletter, I'm going to include a few absolutely wonderful images of those moon inhabitants as part of your bonus goodies. If you aren't already part of the flock, be sure to sign up at the Book Owl podcast dot com slash contact because you probably don't want to miss these. Okay, if you'd like to keep listening, I've got a quick personal update as well as a Book Owl podcast update coming up. But if you're done listening, I just want to thank you for putting me in your ears. And if you like what you've heard, it'd be wonderful if you just told one other person about the show. Okay, update time. First up, the Book Owl podcast has made a new nest over on YouTube. Yay! That's right, there's not really video, it's just a show graphic, but if you click play, you'll get the full podcast episode right through your computer speakers. So if you're a fan of YouTube, I'll have the link to the channel in the show notes, or you can just search for The Book Owl Podcast next time you're popping into YouTube land. As for my personal update, um, during the month of June, I've been taking a break from my 
Cassie Black contemporary fantasy trilogy. And mainly I'm taking that break right now because starting in July, I'm going to be editing and rewriting that trilogy like mad. So I just kind of wanted to get my brain some time off from it. But that doesn't mean I'm just sitting around doing nothing, of course, because I'm always working on some crazy project. So during June, I've been working on the first draft of a standalone novel that combines fantasy with a tiny bit of science fiction. I'm more than halfway through that first draft, which means I've climbed the highest hill and should have smooth sailing from here on out. Well, that's what I hope anyway. All right, everyone, that is it for the book owl. Again, thanks so much for listening and I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media, copyright 2020, all rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod.